in Mark chapter 10, verses uh, 17 to 27. It's the story of the rich young ruler, um, Jesus, encounters this wonderful young man who's described with these three amazing words. And that story is in Mark and Luke and Matthew, so it's obviously important, isn't it? And it comes in the context of importance. Who's the most important? Who's the least important? And just when you think Jesus has got them sussed, you know, or, or they've got him sussed, and he put the child in the midst, he says, become like a little child. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes in who is the living embodiment of a human success story. Okay. And there's lots of detail. He's a ruler. He's respected in society. He's sincere. He's well-mannered. Good master. He's religious. He's, uh, he, up, up, up keep, he keeps the law from his childhood. He's a seeker. He's enthusiastic. He's eager to learn. And he's got a great question. How do I inherit eternal life? So you've got a, mi a mixture of kind of uh, David Beckham and Gandhi. <laughs> I mean, impressive. Impressive or what? Now, the Jews believe that you could be righteous through the works of the law. Joseph, the father of Jesus, Joseph was described as dikaios, righteous, a righteous. And so this young man believes the same, but he wants to make sure. And he comes to Jesus seeking probably assurance, seeking, well, how do I inherit? I've heard you talk about eternal life. How do I inherit eternal life? Is it something more than I'm doing now? What do I do exactly? What do I do? I've kept the rules. But something's missing. You know that, that line in Ecclesiastes where it says um, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Well, he's seeking. He's searching for relationship. He's searching for assurance. And so he checks with Jesus and he says, uh, a good teacher, and it's probably just a term of respect. It's like saying your excellency or something, you know, your highness, depending on who you're talking to. And maybe it's a common term, but Jesus challenges it straight away. Well, who are you calling good? Now, when he says that, he's not denying his own uh, divinity. He's not denying his identity. But he's raising the bar of what goodness is. And he's challenging the young man at the point where he thinks that he himself is pretty darn good. <laughs> Do you see? Do you see? So Jesus questions him straight away. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, listen, anger is really the same as murder. A lustful eye is the same as adultery. He's raising the bar about what goodness, what righteousness really is. Okay, And he's suggesting possibly that this guy is falling a little short. You see, if you're truly convinced that you're following the law from your childhood, what about this law? God takes first place. And then he says, sure, there's one thing you're missing. Leave your money and come and follow me. So he's just putting the word, are you sure you know what good is? And then he's saying, what about the word uh, uh, greed? <laughs> what comes first in your life? You shall have no other gods before me. It's, it's like the first, the cardinal commandment. And that's the point where the young man who is no matter how rich, no matter how young, and no matter how much of a ruler he is, he's failed. He's failed at the first hurdle. And it says the young man went away sad. And it says Jesus loved him. He loved him. It's an unusual phrase. It says he, he loved him for his question. He loved him for his zeal. He loved him for the very fact that he's being there and seeking and reaching for him. But he doesn't call him back. He doesn't say, I was only joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can keep your money. <laughs> John Wesley said, it's not a sin to be rich. It's a sin to die rich. Hmm. He doesn't lower the standard, the demand for, for discipleship. So when we read this passage, we ask ourselves, why did he make it so hard for this wonderful guy? Why does he require such a strict call for, for his followers. And sometimes we try and lessen 
the demands and the cost of discipleship. But this wasn't the only time when Jesus uh, made this uh, uh, appeal, made this call. Uh, you remember in Luke 5, Peter and Andrew left everything to follow Jesus. Matthew, the tax collector, probably rich, left everything. And he, he's got to be well, well to do, hasn't he? And Zacchaeus, uh, it, it comes, it, it attacks his wallet first. His, his, his response to Jesus comes first to his bank account. So it's, and then in the early church, in Acts 2, the first Christians sold everything that they had and gave to the poor and needy among themselves. And so it's been through, through, throughout church history. And now maybe God's not calling you to voluntary poverty, but you do need to ask, what are the things that God is asking you to give up to follow him? You cannot receive this gift of eternal life when your hands are full of something else. So they meet a, a human success story. They see him go away. They're astonished. And even Peter is momentarily silenced. It's like their jaw has hit the ground saying, what? How on earth? <laughs> How can anybody be saved if he can't? Well, Peter has a comeback, but we'll get to that tomorrow. God bless you.